Good morning, friends. Uh, uh, let's uh, begin with our uh, fourth session on the uh, embryology chat. Uh, on the anatomy chat. Uh, so yesterday we spent time looking at the anatomy of the supratentorial structures. Uh, so today we'll take a peek underneath the. Dr. Amit, hello. Uh, the voice is not uh, working. We can't hear you. Sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. OK, apologies. OK, right. Uh, so uh, today we'll have a look at the structures underneath the tent, uh, the brainstem and the cerebellum. So these are the two structures we'll concentrate on, uh, primarily the brainstem, but also we'll spend a brief time looking at the cerebellum. Uh, uh, we have separate sessions to cover these other topics uh, over the next uh, couple of months. Uh, so these topics uh, will be covered uh, later on. So but primarily I'll be concentrating on the on the brainstem and the cerebellum. So how will we uh, look at it? So what, what do we know about the brainstem? You know, we know it's it's probably uh, developmentally one of the oldest parts of the brain. Uh, after the spinal cord, the brainstem is really the archetype uh, within the vertebrates, uh, which kind of integrates the function of uh, uh, various vital centers uh, 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 within it. You know, the breathing, the, the uh, blood pressure center, uh, cardiovascular centers, the swallowing. So fairly basic functioning uh, is integrated at the level of uh, brainstem. And hence to allow for that function, it contains a plethora of nuclei of those cranial nerves. Uh, that link it to the cortex uh, and and to the and to the end organs itself. Not only these uh, end organs in the head neck area, but also it links uh, the uh, the the cerebellum uh, to the uh, to the uh, periphery, but it also links the cerebellum to the cortex and to the spinal cord, but also towards the basal ganglia and the and the and the limbic system. Uh, when we look at the brainstem on an MR scan, uh, there are certain anatomical attributes that we can appreciate and I'll try and highlight those points. Uh, but if you try and understand the internal architecture, it's very difficult because the brainstem looks fairly bland on a on a MR scan. There are four certain pertinent uh, features that you, that you might see. And again, again, those are the ones that I'll highlight. But most of the times we are reliant on the clinicians, uh, on the patient's clinical presentation and the sort of topographic localization of the signal change that we see on MR scan to guess what the structure is likely to be involved. There are certain tricks uh, and, and again, I'll show you what are the tricks here that we can identify these anatomical structures uh, and, and, and this uh, sequence that it's, it's uh, the susceptibility better imaging and we have looked at right at the start uh, 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 of, of our sessions when we looked at this sequence and it can be used to highlight some of the structures of the brainstem. OK, so how are we going to look at the brainstem today? We'll look at the sort of the surface modeling anatomy, structural anatomy of the brainstem. This will be followed by looking at the tracks within the brainstem, the tracks going up and down, front to back and side to side. Then we'll look at the basic structure of the brainstem uh, as to uh, any part of the brainstem. What would it contain? What is the basic architecture of it? From then we will move on to the cerebellar peduncles and we'll talk about that in a minute. And finally, we will look at the various structures at uh, within the brainstem at various levels. So that will be the kind of the structure of over the next uh, 45, 50 minutes. OK, so let's let's look at the first bit, which is the topography of the brainstem, the surface anatomy, if you like. Uh, and, and these are a series of pictures over here. You've got uh, a picto, uh, uh, an MR sagittal T2 weighted sequence here on the right side. This is just pictorial depiction of what a brainstem looks like. So uh, and, and remember, we are going to concentrate on the infratentorial compartment and the tent is the tent over overlying the cerebellum. Uh, and, and, and the brainstem lies within the ventral aspect of the posterior fossa. It's about the ventral half or uh, of the of the uh, of the posterior fossa occupied by the brainstem. And that's quite variable dependent upon the size of the posterior fossa, the size of the fourth ventricle as well. Uh, so what are the structures that we're going to look at? We're going to look at the 
uh, mesencephalon. Remember, we talked about this during neuroembryology, which is the midbrain, which is the sort of a quadrilateral shaped structure, which is placed at right at the top, and it has got a small beak at its end. Uh, just over here. So this is the midbrain that we're going to look at, and the midbrain has its own uh, cavity, which is the aqueduct, which is this small slit like CSF filled space. And sometimes you see a black area within it, and that's because of the flow void, uh, because of the turbulence. So that is the cerebral aqueduct. And then behind that, you have got the tectal plate, and we'll look, talk about these tectal plates uh, later on. Uh, so, so that's kind of at the level of the midbrain, and the midbrain is the one which sort of communicates the supratentorial structures with the rest of the uh, brainstem. Uh, in front of the midbrain, you have got the floor of the third ventricle. Remember uh, the third ventricle we saw yesterday, the thalamus being here, and this is the floor of the third ventricle, and these are the structures along the floor, and we'll discuss that when we look at the cellar and the supracellar region with the optic chiasm, the pituitary infundibulum, and the mammillary body over here. You can just about see those structures over here. But uh, for today's discussion, we're going to concentrate only on the brainstem itself. Then we come to pons, which is kind of this bulging bit of the brainstem, which bulges ventrally, uh, uh, and it's separated from the midbrain by this ponto mesencephalic sulcus. Pons, of course, is derived embryologically from metencephalon. We remember we said mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon, and all of these together will form the rhombencephalon. Rhombencephalon means hindbrain, so we've got the midbrain, which is the mesencephalon, the, rom the um, uh, metencephalon, which is the pons and the cerebellum, and the myelencephalon, which is the middle oblongator. And the fourth ventricle really comes into its own at the level of pons, and you can see this kind of triangular shaped structure, which has got a very, very flat dorsal surface, very important to recognize that on the sagittal T2 sequence, and its apex is kind of at the center of the cerebellum, what we call as a vestigial point. And again, it's important to recognize uh, 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 these structures, just to get a global overview of this, because based on this, you can, when you're looking at some anomalies, you'll recognize that these shapes are altered. Sometimes you can have a flattened pons. Sometimes the pons can be actually bulging backwards, a condition called as a tegmental cap. You have to realize the proportions of the various parts of the brainstem. Usually the midbrain itself is very slightly smaller as compared to the pons, and the pons itself is slightly larger. So the medulla and the midbrain are usually similar in, its, in their height, while the pon is the largest structure of them all. So the pons then uh, uh, is, is joined up with the medulla oblongata over here, uh, and the point over here is, of course, the ponto uh, uh, medullary sulcus. Uh, and the medulla, again, is fairly featureless. If you look at the intrinsic anatomy, it looks pretty featureless over here, except for something on this, at least on this sagittal tissue, you can see a small bump over here. And we'll remember this point as the clava, C-L-A-V-A, clava, or clava, uh, and this is the eminence which is produced by the dorsal tracts which come up. Uh, and this is the point, the dorsal tracts of the uh, cuneatus and gracilis, which are the sensory tracts which come up to this point. And this is the point where they will have their nuclei, the nerve cell nuclei, neuron cell bodies will rest here and following which the sensory decay session will occur before they proceed upwards and onwards. And we'll look at them uh, in, in a short while. Uh, uh, the details of the fourth ventricle we will discuss at, a, at the section on the uh, anatomy of the ventricles. So this is kind of the sagittal profile, if you like, of the brainstem. And I was uh, speaking just earlier on about recognizing these various uh, shapes and, uh, and, and getting an eye of what the proportions are. And here is just to show you how the midbrain has become very, very tall. We have looked at, we have talked about this in embryology session when we talked about the patterning of the uh, of the of the uh, cerebellum, the rhombomeres, and you can see not just the height of this uh, uh, of the midbrain over here, if you compare to that, the shape is abnormal. Instead of that beak that we should have normally anteriorly, it's much more broader at the top end. Uh, you can barely see the tectal plate over there. It's very, very dysmorphic. And look at the angle, the ponto mesencephalic angle. Normally, it should be acute, whilst here it is 
at least right angle in shape and similarly the ponto medullary angle is very dysmorphic and the ventral bulge of the pons uh, is, is uh, also uh, very abnormally shaped obviously this patient has got significant abnormality of the cerebellar hemisphere and uh, for us to be able to suggest what pattern of an abnormality is it is important to recognize these proportions and these shapes so uh, uh, the other topographical structures that we will be looking at are the cerebellar peduncles and these are basically the bundles which connect the cerebellum to the brain stem and these are three the one which connects it to the midbrain the superior cerebellar peduncle the one to the pons the middle and the one to the medulla is the inferior cerebellar peduncles and these basically allow flow of information to and from the cerebellum to the brainstem and these are basically white matter tracks and we'll see their anatomy in a bit more detail later on uh, uh, their uh, their their uh, structure is best appreciated probably in the axial plane uh, or in the coronal plane and we'll, we'll look at that in in a, in a short while uh, what is the basic plan uh, of the brainstem for that We'll have to go into back into our embryology, and this is very important for us to do that so that we can understand what is the internal structure of the brainstem. So uh, I'll just recap a little bit for for those of us who were uh, who were uh, not around when we discussed the embryology. So remember the neural tube when it closed. The neural tube had a cell lining over here, uh, the ependymal lining, and the cells proliferated into the mantle zone, going laterally out. Now there are influences, and we rem we'll remember there is a notochord over here which which secretes special proteins called as morphogenetic proteins, and there are special proteins which are secreted by the ectoderm which are also specific morphogenetic proteins like the sonic hedgehog and they influence these cells and some of these cells are going to then develop into specific group of cells and just over here similar picture over here these have now grouped themselves the dorsal group of nuclei over here are going to form what we call as the alar plate and the ventral group of nuclei which are over here are going to form the basal plate uh, and and this is what happens in a, in the in the in the adult this is in the embryogenesis the dorsal uh, the alar plate over here is going to form the sensory neurons and these are going to then give rise to the sensory nerves whilst the ventral group of neurons are going to form the basal plate and these are going to give rise to the uh, uh, motor neurons there are intermediate neurons which are round about here in the intermediate part of the gray matter so you can recognize the gray matter of the cord over here now just to see how it is organized the spinal cord organization is such that the the nerves the fasciculi are peripheral whilst the cord gray matter is more central so the sensory neurons derivatives of the alar plate are dorsal the motor neurons derivatives of the basal plate are ventral and these intermediate neurons are basically those that gives rise to the sympathetic outflow uh, of of the uh, from from the spinal cord and these will then give rise to the uh, uh, gustatory uh, uh, outflow the sympathetic outflow to the bowels and the heart at various levels so what happens at the level of the brain stem so this is what is normal within the spinal cord but what happens at the brain stem imagine you are now opening up the fourth the ventricular system from behind and it is stretched laterally on both sides so this aspect is represented by this structure over here and this is the floor the roof of the ventricle this is still the floor which is round about here so this is the full floor of the ventricle this is the roof all the sensory nuclei which are posterior are going to be stretched laterally so the structure is the sensory nuclei are lateral the motor nuclei are more medial and the intermediate nuclei are the ones which are the sympathetic nuclei are then placed uh, in 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 the between those two and this is the same pattern that we see in the adult over here uh, the the fourth ventricle has been opened up from behind the the, the spine the canal has been opened up from behind the sensory nuclei are more lateral the motor nuclei are more medial and the intermediate nuclei are the ones which are going to be responsible for the uh, uh, for the sympathetic and parasympathetic outflow uh, and and that is the basic pattern basic pattern of the brain stem throughout uh, if, if you remember this, uh, you'll remember the anatomy uh, much more easier. So this is just a coronal profile. This is the midline. This is the level of the cerebral peduncles, mesencephalon, pons, midbrain, 
and the medulla. So the blue colored nuclei are the ones which are very much close to the midline are the motor nuclei. So these are the motor nuclei of the third, the fourth nerve. These are the motor. This is the motor nucleus of the trigeminal nerve. Similarly, you have the motor nucleus of the facial nerve as well as the twelfth nerve. So the motor nuclei are in the midline, very close to the midline. As you go more laterally, you have got the sensory nucleus, the sensory nucleus, mesencephalic nucleus of the trigeminal nerve, the pontine component as well as the spinal component lying much more lateral. Similarly, in lateral location are the vestibular and the cochlear nuclei, which are also the sensory nuclei of the brainstem. And this is what we see uh, in, 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 the, in the brainstem, the motor nuclei, for example, the twelfth nerve, the facial nerve, the third nerve nucleus, this will all be lying medially, while the more lateral nuclei, the trigeminal nucleus, the cochlear vestibular, which will be lying much more lateral, whilst the visceral nuclei, which were the outflow for the sympathetic and parasympathetic, will be in the intermediate plane. And this is the basic plan. Uh, after this, we'll look at some of the basic structures of the uh, tracks within the brainstem. And uh, there are very many tracks and it's impossible to cover all of them, uh, but we'll cover some of the important ascending and descending tracks and, and, and try and see how we, whether we can figure out the structure of the brainstem where these where these tracks lie. OK, so uh, let's let's start with the ascending track. The ascending tract are basically the uh, the sensory tracts and these basically ascend from the spinal cord, ascend through the spinal cord, up the medulla and through uh, the brainstem finally reach their destination within the cortex. Uh, the first order neuron usually starts within the periphery uh, uh, over it's either the pain, the touch, the proprioception uh, uh, fibers that come along and these travel within the spinal cord. So for example, over here you can see this is the uh, uh, C2 level spinal nerve which comes over and these are the spinothalamic tracts which cross at the level of the cord at the level where they enter they are going to cross as opposed to the uh, 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 more uh, uh, well-defined uh, fasciculus uh, cuneatus and gracilis which are located more posteriorly and they will carry the fine uh, uh, touch uh, and uh, 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 proprioception fibers which are more posteriorly placed and these do not cross at this level. They climb up posteriorly at the same level and the decussation of these fasciculus gracilis cuneatus which are located at the back occurs at the level of medulla where they come from back forward and then they go ventrally within the brainstem and again slowly migrate posteriorly. And these both these tracks, the cortico, the, the spinothalamic tract and the fasciculus cuneatus and gracilis, which climb up into the in the spinal cord, one lying anterolaterally and the other lying dorsally, they climb up and they join up round about the lower midbrain uh, to reach the thalamus. And we saw yesterday uh, where the, the thalamus being the relay station, and from there the third order neuron then goes to the somatosensory cortex in the post central gyrus. So these these are the uh, uh, ascending tracks, if you like, the two most common ones that uh, that that we talk about and can be a certain the dorsal one, the cuneatus and the gracilis and the uh, the lateral one, which are the uh, spinothalamic tracks. The dorsal tracks over here where they decussate the sensory decussation after that they are called as the uh, medial lemniscae and hence this whole system is called as the dorsal medial lemniscal system and this is just to show you uh, what what we can expect so we saw uh, earlier on this point over here which is the cleva which is actually the tubercle uh, of the uh, fasciculus gracilis and cuneatus which is kind of located at this level because that's where the nuclei of these nerves lie. So these nerves, these are the uh, axons of these nerves and the nuclei lie here. And then this gives rise to the second order neuron, which then crosses, uh, giving rise to the sensory decussation and then climbs up. So the nuclei are located here and after which, so again here showing these are the nuclei which are kind of located here. And then you get the uh, uh, medial lemniscal system, which climbs up goes in the posterior third of the pons and then finally up into the midbrain and the thalamus. So this is at the level of the midbrain. This is at the level of uh, 
the, uh, the the cervical cord and you can see that the posterior cord is involved and this patient has a condition called as subacute combined degeneration due to b12 deficiency and you can see how this track kind of converge up to the level of cleva so this is involvement of the dorsal lemniscal system uh, and 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 this here is at the level of uh, of the lower midbrain where the tracks are a little bit more posterior uh, rather than ventral and you can see that this, this patient has sensory symptoms on the opposite side of the body because of involvement, because of the small area of infarction affecting the dorsal medial lemniscal system. So that is the sensory tract. And of course, within the brainstem itself, it is very difficult to figure out where it resides, except right at the lower end of the of the uh, medulla, where you know lies the uh, 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 tubercles of these uh, uh, nuclei and the decussation occurs here. Further up, it's very difficult difficult to map out the tracks of these uh, system. Looking at the uh, descending pathways, uh, they are a bit more uh, better defined than the ascending pathways in terms of the MR, MR anat anatomy. So uh, these are basically the uh, motor pathways which start from the cortex and descend down the brainstem into the cord. Of course, they don't have to go to the cord. Some of them will uh, uh, function uh, will relay with the brainstem nuclei. So this is a corticospinal tract which controls the uh, uh, upper limbs and lower limbs. But similarly, there will be corticonuclear tracts which will be controlling the uh, cranial nuclei. And the third set of descending tracts uh, are the corticopontocerebellar because uh, the cerebellum needs to understand how the uh, how what what is the program that the precentral gyrus and the uh, and the prefrontal cortex is deciding and it's it needs to modulate that function and that is done via this cortico ponto cerebellar fibers which basically enter the pons and then crisscross across in a transverse manner and enter into the cerebellar hemisphere so the corticospinal tracts, you know, which descend down into the, uh, we saw yesterday the, uh, the the white matter tracts, the projection fibers we call them, they went down the corona, the centrum somia vale, the corona radiata, the internal capsule. From the internal capsule, they will descend into this structure on the midbrain, and this is the part of the midbrain. Now we are going to look at. So the midbrain is comprised of this ventral aspect, what we call as the crus cerebrus. And in this crus cerebrus uh, is, is located the corticopont, the nuclear, the corticopontine and the corticospinal tracts. And this patient had a previous old infarction in the right hemisphere. And you can see the degree of atrophy that has occurred as a result of that. And this is nothing but an appearance what we call as Wallerian degeneration. Sometimes we can actually see the signal change within the white matter tracts. And this is nothing but atrophy of that right cerebral uh, cerebral peduncle or the, or the crus cerebrus as we call it. This is at the level of pons. So the white matter tracts, descending tracts are located anteriorly at the level of pons over here. This patient has an infarction on the right side. These occupy a much more ventral space. Uh, still lying anteriorly are the cortico uh, spinal tracts, but the cortico pontine tracts are going to now start going posteriorly and laterally into the pons. Similarly, the corticonuclear tracts are going to start going more posteriorly to innervate some of the motor nerve nuclei as well as the sensory nerve and nuclei. As we go further down, we are now coming up to the level of medulla and you get the structure here, which are called as medullary pyramids. And we look at this a bit more detail and these are located most ventrally. And after this, you will start seeing the pyramidal decussation or the motor decussation, which occurs at the level of the of the uh, of the pyramid uh, of the lower medulla and this is just to show you the ventral location of the corticospinal tracts and the motor decussation and then these fibers are then located in the lateral corticospinal tract within the spinal cord so these are this is one of the descending pathways uh, and and you can map that out on mr tectrography you can see the corticospinal tracts here the descending tracts coming from the internal capsule going down ventrally you can see how there are many fibers here from the internal capsule which descend onto a small area in the crust cerebrus and then they go down into the spinal cord and these go posteriorly because these are the corticospinal tracts of the decussation and the green fibers are the ones which are going more in the anterior posterior direction this is a lateral view and these are the cortico ponto cerebellar uh, tracks which are going to innervate the cerebellar cortex and the cerebellar nuclei. Uh, 
uh, we talked briefly about the cortical nu nuclear tracts. We cannot distinguish them on imaging, but these are basically to innervate these various cranial nerve nuclei, which are located throughout the brainstem uh, to enable their uh, function. There are certain tracts which in the brainstem which we know exist and which can see uh, uh, based upon the pathology when it affects them and by virtue of the location. And I'll have a brief mention of this structure called as medial longitudinal fasciculus. And this is located very close to the floor of the fourth ventricle. So this is the fourth ventricle over here. You have got the pons in front, the cerebellum at the back, the fourth ventricle, and right along the floor of the fourth ventricle is a longitudinal. Uh, it's like a cable. It's like an intercom between this cranial nerve nuclei. And this intercom basically allows a rapid communication between the various cranial nerve nuclei right from the midbrain up to the upper end of the medulla. And basically it allows crosstalk between the nuclei which control the eye function. So it allows uh, information from the oculomotor nerve, the abducens nerve, as well as the trochlear nerve on the same side, but also the opposite side. And that allows for conjugate eye movement to occur. Uh, and any involvement of this, uh, this structure will give rise to diplopia. As you can see in this patient over here, this is the fourth ventricle. This is at the lower end of the midbrain, upper end of the pons. We have got a cerebellum. This tiny structure here is a fourth ventricle. And just along the floor of the fourth ventricle, you've got this high signal just to the right side of the midline, midline uh, reminiscent of involvement of the medial longitudinal fasciculus. And here it is this uh, in, in, in another patient, again, at the level of the lower end of the midbrain over here, you can just about see the superior uh, cerebellar peduncle. Uh, uh, there are certain tracks again which we exist uh, uh, and we do not really know uh, where they are on anatomically uh, just on an MR scan, but we know they exist because they can manifest themselves after pathology. So uh, I just want to uh, briefly describe this concept of uh, gillian molare triangle uh, just to explain how we know about this existence of this tracks. So for those of you who, who don't know what this triangle is, it's basically a triangle which exists between the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum the red nucleus on the opposite side and the inferior olivary nucleus. And this is a circuit. We talked about circuits yesterday within the brain. So this is a circuit which exists between this. So what happens is the dentate nucleus, which is around about located at this level within the cerebellum itself, talks to the red nucleus on the other side via the superior cerebellar peduncle. So there are white matter tracks which go across from the dentate nucleus to the red nucleus. So the dentate nucleus from this side via the superior cerebellar peduncle is talking, is communicating with the red nucleus on the opposite side. The red nucleus communicates with the inferior olivary nucleus on the same side. So these are descending tracks which go down and talk to a special nucleus called as the inferior olivary nucleus, which is a structure which produces a bump on the medulla on its anterolateral aspect. You can see there are two bumps within the ventral medulla, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail on the cross-sectional anatomy of the medulla. But this are the this is a bump produced by the pyramids, the corticospinal tract, and this bump is produced by the inferior olivary nucleus, which is located just behind the corticospinal tracts. And uh, the red nucleus synapses uh, with the inferior olivary nucleus. And finally, to complete the triangle, the inferior olivary nucleus talks with the dentate nucleus uh, via the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And just to show you what the pathology, uh, what why am I showing you this case is because this patient, any interruption along uh, this pathway affects uh, the other structures. So here we have a patient who has a pathology round about this level at the level of the red nucleus, and there is interruption of these fibers descending towards the inferior olivary nucleus, and you get a condition called as hypertrophic olivary degeneration. And you can see the signal change over here. The pathology actually has affected at the red nucleus level. There is a bleed because of the cavernoma, but its effect can also be seen at the level of the olivary nucleus. And this patient typically produce what we call as palatal myoclonus. And this is because of interruption of the rubro olivary tract, which is part of this Gullian Moller triangle. So just to emphasize that there are various tracts, various circuits within the brainstem, which manifest themselves based on the uh, on the pathology that we see. Uh, 
Okay, so now the next uh, 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 15, 20 minutes, I'll be uh, spending some time looking at the intrinsic anatomy of the medulla uh, of the various uh, 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 structures within the brainstem. We'll start with the medulla, then look at pons and the and the uh, midbrain finally. Okay, so the medulla oblongata, which is this part over here, which starts at the lower end of the pons, the pontomedullary junction, and it ends at the seri uh, medullo spinal medullary junction over here at the level of foramen magnum. And again, it's defined by this very small protuberance on the dorsal surface. As we said, it's a tubercle called as a cleva, which are where the nuclear bodies of the dorsal lemniscal system reside. They're very difficult to appreciate on the axial sequence. Again, on the axial sequence over here, the medulla looks slightly bland, suspended in this perimedullary system, the CSF spaces, which house various structures, and we are just about seeing the vertebral arteries on either side. Uh, we'll see a little bit more of detail of, of, uh, of the medulla uh, uh, on, on, on the next couple of slices. Remember our anatomy, we talked about a basic pattern. The cranial now nuclei are located posteriorly. The motor ones are more medially. The lateral ones are, uh, are the sensory and the inferior cerebellar peduncle. Inferior cerebellar peduncle communicates the uh, medulla with the cerebellum itself. Uh, we talked about the pyramids earlier on and the olive producing these two distinct bumps. So this is the pyramidal bump and this is the protuberance of the inferior olivary nucleus. Again shown over here, pyramid inferior olive and this is a pyramidal olivary sulcus and this is a retro olivary sulcus. And it's just important to recognize the cell size because these serve to identify the exit points of cranial nerve. 12 and we look at this when we talk about the cranial nerves uh, in, in subsequent sessions and it's that's why it's so important but also sorry I'm just going to check the battery it's uh, just give me a second apologies OK, so uh, and that's the reason why it's so important to recognize this topographical anatomy. And here you have got a patient who's developed an infarction and you can see that the pyramid has been spared. These are the pyramidal tracts, but what it involves is really this big inferior olivary nucleus and more posterior part, which is where the sensory decussion lies. So this is where the patient uh, would present with sensory loss uh, rather than a pyramidal weakness. Uh, and these are various patterns of medullary infarcts. Just to show you the different examples, this is involving virtually the entire left half of the medulla, whilst this involves principally the posterior lateral aspect. And if you just go back one slide, you can see that the posterior lateral aspect is where the inferior cerebellar peduncle and some of the vestibular nuclei will reside. And this will give rise to the patient's symptoms of ataxia because this is the pathway which communicates the spinal cord with the cerebellum and hence we lose the spinal proprioception giving rise to the sensory ataxia as uh, the, the the ataxia related to spinal uh, the tracks which cannot cross into the uh, cerebellum similarly we will get the a descending fire, the descending nucleus of the trigeminal nerve and the track in this location sometimes these patients can also have uh, uh, trigeminal symptoms related to the left side of the face. And finally, they could also suffer from Horner syndrome because of the location of the sympathetic trunk which descends in this space. And uh, for those of you who know, of course, this is the Wallenberg syndrome. And this can be associated with infarctions of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, which is a branch of the vertebral artery. And again, we're going to discuss a lot about this arterial anatomy, but this word is posterior inferior spinal art, uh, cerebellar artery, not only supplies the posterior lateral medulla, but also supplies the inferior cerebellar hemisphere. And in here you can see the small loop of that artery in the retro medullary segment, but causing infarction within the medulla, but also within the cerebellum. Uh, and, and this is another patient, an infarction, which involves the almost the full length of the of the medulla on both sides, as you can see, the pyramids are spared, the olive is spared. So it's going to probably affect the decussation, probably of both the sensory and the motor. But over here lie the motor nerve nuclei of the 12th nerve, and this patient is likely to develop 
hypoglossal palsy probably on both sides and another patient over here in function at the level of the ponto medullary uh, junction over here and this is after the sensory decussation has occurred it lies behind the pyramids and this is where the medial lemonisci are in the lower half as they are traversing from posteriorly anteriorly and then back posteriorly so this patient presents with pure sensory loss on the opposite side of the body uh, moving on to pons let's look at some of the basic structure of pons we have seen the pons as it protrudes out into the uh, 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 into the cistern and the cistern in front of course is the prepontine cistern with the ponta with the basilar artery in the front in front of that lies of course the uh, cella tercica the the clivus and the cella tercica over here on either side are the cerebello pontine angle systems with the internal auditor canals but today we are going to look at the intrinsic structure of pons the pons is connected to the cerebellum via these big bands which are the middle cerebellar peduncles otherwise the structure of pons looks pretty bland except for the small area right at the back and we'll look at that in a minute uh, on the next slide if you look at the internal architecture of pons uh, the vent uh, the the cranial nerve nuclei are located over here so you have got a sixth nerve nucleus you will have the seventh nerve nucleus located over here the corticospinal tracts the corticopontine tracts the corticonuclear tracts are located anteriorly in this area of the pons what we call as a basi pontus Basi pontus is this big bulk of the pons. Then you get the pontine tegmentum, and finally the small pontine tectum over here, which goes all the way around. So the basi pontus contains most of the corticos uh, of the, of the motor pathways, and it's important to, to recognize this kind of striated appearance. Even you see on an MR scan this striated appearance, and this striated appearance is created by this cortico ponto cerebellar tracts, which traverse laterally, crossing across the midline. towards the cerebellum giving rise to this striated appearance and this striated appearance is also seen in this infarcts because the nuclei are dispersed uh, within within the within the uh, within the pons because of this uh, transversely oriented fibers uh, and you can see here this is a patient with demyelination there are two areas of high signal change and this is a fairly characteristic appearance of the trigeminal nerve intra axial fasciculus so the trigeminal nerve Uh, uh exits the brain stem round about this level here and then its roots traverse anteriorly via the meckel's cave to their uh, further destinations uh, uh we, we were talking of the cranial nerve nuclei over, over here of course the medial longitudinal fasciculus lies very close to the floor of the fourth ventricle but two important nuclei that we know are the uh, seventh uh, Uh, now nucleus and the abducens now nucleus which lie along the ventral aspect of the pons and they produce sort of dorsal aspect of the pons and produce this dorsal bulge and that is called as a facial colliculus and that's cro crossed by the facial nerve which kind of arches back uh, its fibers before it exits and this is the abducens which uh, now which carries its fibers ventrally straight and you can just about see this bulge which is produced by the facial colliculus in this patient and this patient has got uh, abducens palsy because of a bleed from a cavernoma which is located at the level of the facial colliculus just deep to it at the level of the abducens now nucleus uh, the midbrain we have looked at the midbrain earlier on we have said it connects the uh, internal capsule the thalamus to the lower uh, um, uh, brain stem uh, and its structures we have said yes it's got a cerebral peduncle wherein lie most of the corticospinal corticonuclear and corticobulbar tracts uh, it is uh, separated from each other by this v shaped notch what we call as the interpeduncular notch and it's a very important structure over here because the third nerve will be exiting from this point as it exit as it uh, because the nuclei are located more posteriorly around this cerebral aqueduct and they exit ventrally via this uh, small space called as the interpeduncular notch the the structure of the midbrain apart from this is bland uh, internally it's very difficult to distinguish various uh, uh, tracks within it uh, but we know there are certain things which which we can highlight and for example you have got the uh, the substantia nigra which appears as a low signal area within the brain within the medulla within the midbrain and the red nucleus which are more rounded in structures uh, 
so uh, just to look at this, we have talked about this yesterday when we talked about the corpus triatum uh, and the importance of of these uh, of the structures over here. So again, this is a cerebral peduncle over here. You can see the dark appearance of the substantia nigra, then the red nucleus, and these are separated again by a slightly less dark band also of the substantia nigra. Uh, and this is a high resolution T2 sequence over here, patient presenting with left sided third nerve palsy. This is the aqueduct and this is the peri aqueductal gray area wherein lie the cranial nerve third and at the lower level, the fourth nerve nucleus also resides. Uh, the cranial nerve third fibers will cross anteriorly along the medial aspect of the red nucleus and exit out through the interpeduncular cistern. Uh, uh, as I said, we will discuss the anatomy of that uh, cistern uh, in a more detail when we talk about the nuclei and, and the uh, CSF spaces. Obviously, any uh, infarction of in, around this area is going to cause paresis of the third nerve, but is also going to result in diplopia because of the involvement of the medial longitudinal fasciculus and here is a patient who has got listeria encephalitis and you can see how both cerebral peduncles are involved and also to show how the cerebral peduncles actually are in direct communication with the thalamus but also with the corticospinal tracts via the internal capsule uh, we talked about the substantia nigra and again this is just to recap the red nucleus over here and this is the substantia nigra reticularis here more ventrally and the compacta which is the dopaminergic outflow going to the corpus triatum superiorly uh, i think we have talked about this okay so uh, uh, there are two special structures that we need mentioning, especially at the level of the uh, midbrain, and these are called as colliculi. So the uh, ventral aspect of the cerebellum, which is this aspect, is the cerebral peduncle. Then you get the tech, uh, tegmentum over here at the back, but behind the aqueduct, there are these two special areas called as the tectal plates. This is the tectum of the midbrain and this tectum has got two bumps at the back what we call as colliculi we have got a superior colliculus which occurs at the level of the upper half of the midbrain and there is an inferior colliculus which is at the lower half the superior colliculus and these two colliculi are very essential for processing of the visual and the auditory pathways the superior colliculus is very much and we saw this yesterday uh, in communication with the lateral geminiculate body and is very important in our accommodation reflexes and it talks with the oculomotor nerve nucleus, whilst the inferior colliculus talks with the uh, vestibular apparatus and the auditory apparatus, and is uh, is very crucial uh, uh, in its and in integral in the pathway for the auditory sensations which pass via the uh, inferior colliculus into the medial geniculate body and to the temporal cortex. So here is a patient who has diffuse axonal injury. I've not shown you the rest of the scan. There is some siderosis, this low signal on the cerebral vomis, and you can see the small hemorrhage within the superior colliculus. This is another patient over here. This is the dorsal aspect of the midbrain. Round about this level, you're going to get a superior cerebral peduncle. You can just about see the superior cerebral peduncle over here, which leads towards the inferior aspect of the midbrain over here. You've got a superior collicula here, the inferior colliculus, and this is the inferior colliculus, a patient who actually had metastasis in the inferior colliculus. Uh, and, and, and this is just to show you the collicular anatomy. Uh, and this is fairly recognizable on the sagittal as well as on the axial. And the importance, of course, of the inferior colliculus is this is the area where the trochlear nerve comes out uh, and traverses uh, forward. So the trochlear nerve being the only nerve which exits the brainstem dorsally. All the other cranial nerves are the ones which exit anteriorly, but the trochlear nerve is the only one which exits dorsally. Uh, uh, just looking through the cerebellar peduncles, we have talked about them uh, 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 during the course of this discussion. Uh, there are three of them, the superior, the middle and the inferior. Let's look at their anatomy in a little bit more detail. Superior, of course, communicates with the midbrain. The middle communicates with the pons and the inferior cerebellar peduncle will communicate with the medulla oblongata. So the, uh, uh, the 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 superior cerebellar peduncle and it's it's is basically an outflow mainly from the cerebellar nuclei, the deep cerebellar nuclei, and we look at these cerebellar nuclei when we talk about the cerebellum, and these are the outflow tracks coming out from these cerebellar nuclei, which go 
either to the thalamus or to the red nucleus. And we saw earlier on the triangle of Gullerin and Mullerite, uh, which was responsible uh, uh, for involvement of this of these fibers. Uh, similarly, the middle cerebellar peduncle is a, is is a, a, a track which brings fibers into the cerebellum from the cortico uh, from the from the cortex via the cortico ponto cerebellar fibers so these are the cortico ponto cerebellar fibers which enter the cerebellum via the middle cerebellar peduncle the inferior cerebellar peduncle is actually an afferent system which is going to bring again tracks into the cerebellum and it's going to bring the tracks from the spinal cord the proprioception via the spinal cerebellar uh, tracks and they enter the cerebellum so the cerebellum kind of talks with the brain stem uh, 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 and with the rest of the bo body why this why these three cerebellar peduncles superior outflow uh, middle inflow inferior also being the inflow uh, let's just look at some of uh, some examples uh, over here so this is at the level of midbrain we saw earlier on the midbrain uh, being nice and turgid but here you can see how the midbrain has become atrophied and it's something that you have to develop an eye to to see the more scans you see the more you'll realize and appreciate this atrophy this is a patient has a degenerative condition which affects the upper midbrain amongst other areas of the parts of the brain and it gives rise to this appearance over here where there is not only involvement of the superior cerebral peduncles which is atrophied on both sides but also so the upper part of the midbrain is atrophied and the beak that we saw which was small earlier on is much more larger giving rise to this typical appearance of a hummingbird uh, uh, beaked sign as it is called as uh, uh, in, in this particular uh, pattern of uh, atrophy uh, of, of, of the upper midbrain you can have congenital anomalies when when there is anomalous thickening of the tract and that is because there are certain tracks which are not developed lower down and this allows this track to become much more dominant and allow transmission of fibers through them giving rise to this much thickened appearance of the superior cerebellar peduncles and they are also much parallel to each other so if you see these cerebral peduncles are usually more converging or uh, but these ones are much more parallel to each each other giving rise to this h shaped sign in joubert syndrome uh, the middle cerebellar peduncle is the largest, much easier to observe on the axial T2 sequence. Very easy to see. Again, fairly bland over here. This is at the level of pons. That's where you see them best. Very thick bundle. They contain mainly the uh, uh, white matter tracks, which come from the cortex to the cerebellum. So the cortico ponto cerebellar tracks. So this is the inflow into the cerebellum. Uh, uh, and 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 these uh, these these uh, uh, can get affected in very many conditions. And I've just shown you a couple of examples over here. You, of course, you can get infunctions within them, but you can also get uh, this condition over here or less progress uh, uh, multifocal leukomalacia, which is seen in HIV individuals, wherein there is involvement of the middle cerebellar peduncle, but also of the white matter tract of the cerebellum itself. Uh, and it's in spite of the uh, size of the lesion, there is hardly any mass effect on the fourth ventricle. Uh, and this is another degenerative condition where you lose the normal signal within the middle cerebellar peduncle uh, and they become very bright. This condition, this patient has got a degenerative condition called as multi-system atrophy. There is degeneration of this transverse pontine fibers and you get this typical appearance, what is described as a hot cross bun appearance. But of course, you can get other pathologies which can affect the middle cerebral peduncle as well. But this is just to show, uh, show to highlight the uh, specific uh, appearance of middle cerebral peduncle in these diseases. The inferior cerebral peduncle is probably the most difficult one to see uh, 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 amongst all three of them because it's kind of in a slightly very oblique plane in both the coronal as well as the sagittal and it's located at the level of the upper medulla and the posterior lateral aspect so this aspect of the medulla so the medulla has got an anterior, as anterior aspect we saw the pyramids the olives uh, and then the most posterior lateral aspect over here, which is very close to the fourth ventricle, the outflow of the fourth ventricle. And we look at that outflow when we talk about the anatomy of the ventricles, what we call as a foramen of Lushka, the lateral. And just anterior to that is this area called as the restiform body, which also is the inferior cerebellar peduncle. And it can get involved. And we saw earlier on a okay, patient with infarction of the posterior lateral medulla, which involves the inferior cerebellar peduncle uh, in a syndrome, what we call as the wall syndrome. Uh, 
so that was kind of the brief anatomy, if you like, of the brainstem. We looked at the various levels of brainstem. Uh, we looked at the normal anatomy, structural anatomy of the brainstem, the topographic anatomy. Uh, uh, we looked at how the brainstem has evolved from the spinal cord. And, and, and we have looked at the cerebellar peduncles. Uh, in the last uh, 10 odd minutes, we will look at the cerebellum itself. Uh, the cerebellum, you know, it's very, very vital uh, for these functions, uh, balance, the tone, but also it modulates the motor control from the cortex. But increasingly, it has been realized it's also very important in, in the cognition and the, and, the, and the emotion function. So even though it is, uh, it is a fairly uh, old structure phylogenetically, it has increasingly evolved itself, especially in the higher uh, uh, vertebrates and the amphibians to uh, to develop this more specific functions of emotion and cognition in direct communication with the cerebral cortex. Uh, and embryologically, again, developmentally, the cerebellum comprises three parts. We have got the spinocerebellum, which is kind of the midline over here, which is the mainly the vermis. Then we have got the uh, 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 cerebrocerebellum, which is the more lateral, and then this is the vestibulocerebellum, which is a very small part, which is the flocculonodular lobe over here. Uh, and this part of the cerebellum, the flocculonodular lobe, is probably the oldest part of the cerebellum developmentally, which can be seen even in the invertebrates as well. And this is the archicerebellum, followed by the spinocerebellum, which is the pali cerebellum, intermediate cerebellum, and the uh, uh, ecologic, uh, the, the, the one which has developed the most latest is the cerebellar hemispheres, which are the neocerebellum, the neocerebellar cortex. Uh, and, and, and this uh, again reflects this slide to just to show you where these functions are located. The emotion, interestingly, is, I have learned, is located within the vermis itself, whilst in the more lat uh, lateral aspect in this intermediate zone are uh, the motor functions, whilst a lot of uh, cognition is uh, recognized in these cerebellar uh, hemispheres. Uh, so the cerebellum itself has got a cerebellar vermis in the midline and the hemispheres laterally, of course. Uh, uh, and on the surface of the cerebellum, you've got this cerebellar folia, which are like grooves of the cerebellum. And this increases the surface area of the cerebellum, much similar to the sulci and the gyri on the surface of the brain to so much so that if you unfold the cerebellum, it will be much larger than the cerebral cortex surface area and the cerebellar nuclei also are much many more in number as compared to the cortex. Uh, we, we saw how the cerebellum uh, links in with the brainstem earlier on. Uh, and just to show you again the anatomy, the, if, you, if, you, if you look at the anatomy of the vermis uh, in the anatomy textbooks, they are very much described based upon where they are located. It is very difficult to name them on an MR scan uh, as to which ones are which parts of the vermis. Uh, the ones that we persistently identify are the lobes of the vermis, and this is the primary fissure of the, uh, of, of the vermis, and the one anterior is the anterior lobe. The vast majority is the posterior lobe, and the very small area tucked inside is the uh, a flocculonodular lobe uh, of, the, of the cerebellum. Uh, uh, again, it's important to recognize the uh, that the cerebellum sits fairly centrally uh, over this point, which is called as a fastigial point over here. Uh, and it is also the midpoint on the dorsal aspect of the pons, which should be flat. And this is just to get us an, uh, an eye as to how the cerebellum should be. Uh, and, and, and the cerebellar folia are appreciated over here. You can see uh, the cerebellar folia in the vermis. And this is the child who's developed cerebellar atrophy. And you can see that there are folia are markedly prominent uh, and the gyra are much, much more shriveled. This is another person over here. You can see that the inferior vermis is hypoplastic, allowing this fourth ventricle to kind of escape out into the cisterna magna right at the back where this big channel, the foramina of Magendry. Uh, the cerebellum itself has got the vermis. We saw the and the, the cerebellar cortex. The cerebellar cortex itself very much folded, very much like the cerebral cortex, and the white matter tracts uh, then arborize themselves to reach this subcortical areas of the of the. Uh, uh, cerebral cortex, and this appearance is described as arbor vitae, the spreading of the white matter tracts into the deep folia of the of the cerebellum and this is uh, again an MR uh, representation of the same the white matter tracks the cortex uh, and then you can just about see this white matter tracks reaching the deeper aspects of the cerebellar cortex uh, 
uh, and and the salsa normally should contain CSF and will appear as black. And if you give contrast, and if you see this kind of weird looking appearance, striated appearance, or on a coronal scan, you can see that the, some of the cells are enhancing. This patient has got metastasis because uh, of of uh, spread of cancer on the surface, on the leptomeningeal surface of the cerebellum, uh, giving rise to this appearance. Uh, and disease can affect uh, any part of the cerebellum. Of course, it can affect the uh, the vermis, uh, like here. And in the same patient, you have got the inferior cerebellar hemisphere, which is affected. This is a patient who has got tuberculous granulomas affecting the vermis and the paravomian region, but also affecting the cerebellar cortex laterally. Similarly, you can have infarcts, which can affect various aspects of the cerebellum. Uh, it's very difficult to distinguish uh, uh, cerebellar uh, lobes into different compartments. And we talk in terms of the inferior cerebellar hemisphere uh, uh, or the superior cerebellar hemisphere, which is much more easier to explain when the pathology, when the infarction is very close to the medulla or is very close to the midbrain. And you can see these areas of infarction and the intermediate part of the cerebellum is very difficult to uh, distinguish into the two halves. And hence we describe as an infarction at the level of the middle cerebellar peduncle. And, uh, and 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 based on this, you can describe the various territories of of the cerebellum, which of course we'll discuss when we look at the uh, vascular supply of the of the brain. Uh, there are certain specific uh, areas of the cerebellum which perhaps I can highlight. Uh, we looked at the cerebellar uh, cortex earlier on, uh, uh, and and the and the vermis, but there is one special area called as the cerebellar tonsil, which usually is just slightly para vermian in location. It's not in the midline, it's just off the midline. It is uh, uh, involved in the inferior aspect of the cerebellar hemisphere. And you kind of see it in a condition called as the Chiari malformation, where the cerebellar tonsils squeeze out through the foramen magnum. In normal circumstances, the entire cerebellum should lie at the level of the foramen magnum or above it, or actually within three to four millimeters. But sometimes the cerebellum can herniate through the foramen magnum, reaching almost up to the C1 arch. And this is a condition called as herniation of the cerebellar tonsils, uh, uh, causing uh, giving rise to the condition called as Chiari malformation. And this is another example uh, of uh, of, of a part of the cerebral cortex that we can see, which is called as a flocculus, and it can produce this weird appearance. Sometimes uh, uh, people will mistake this for tumors within the cerebral pontine angle system, and we just have to follow the slices up and down to realize that it is actually just part of the cerebellum itself, and it has the same signal as the rest of the cerebellum. Uh, and and finally, we have looked at the so we have looked at the cerebellar vermis. We have looked at the cortex. A brief mention of the cerebellar nuclei, and we talked about the cerebellar nuclei when we talked about the development of the rhombencephalon. So this is the developing rhombencephalon over here, the part of the fourth ventricle, the lateral aspect of that, what we call as a rhombic lip, and this rhombic lip will then proliferate and send nuclei much more peripherally to form the cerebellar cortex, but there are certain nuclei which will congregate themselves around this fourth ventricle, and these are the deep nuclei. Similar to cerebral cortex, we have got the cerebral cortex peripherally, and we have got the deep nuclei, the basal nuclei centrally. Similarly, cerebellum itself has some nuclei which will concentrate around the fourth ventricle over here. So this is about the rhombic lip area, and the cells will migrate and develop the cerebellar cortex, but there are some nuclei which will not migrate and congregate themselves around this area. Uh, and these are the deep cerebellar nuclei. And they've got four different names, the dentate, the emboliformis, the fastigious and uh, globosus. Uh, but the one that is typically talked about is the dentate nucleus, which has this C-shaped appearance, and it can get affected in various conditions. And this patient has got a, a syndrome called as a FAR syndrome with calcification seen within the dentate nucleus uh, on, on, on this side. OK, so that was in brief the anatomy of the uh, of the cerebellum. So uh, this is just uh, uh, what we have done today. We have looked at the anatomy organization of the brainstem uh, and the cerebellum. We have looked at the cross-sectional anatomy at various levels. Uh, we, have, we have looked at the tracks, but what perhaps I want to you to understand is that in the brainstem, it is difficult to identify in a normal brainstem these various structures, except when we start appreciating the pathology and hence the intrinsic anatomy becomes much more relevant uh, in, in understanding.
I think I'll, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take any questions if you have any questions. Dr. Hwatka, can you hear me? I can, yes, please. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, Sorry, can you identify yourself, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, it's uh, Daniel here. Daniel oh, Lurie. Daniel, hello. Yes, I can see your hand as well, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Hi. Um, just a very quick question, actually. The, the cerebellar tonsils, um, no. are they an extension of the vermis, are they, or do they actually derive from the cerebro cerebe cerebellum? So they are actually part of the uh, lobes themselves. So they are paravermian in location. And uh, though we see it on the mid sagittal section because the uh, thickness of the slice is that we do are usually five millimeters and you cannot distinguish these tonsils in the paravermian location, but they are actually parts of the cerebellar lobes rather than the vermis itself. I see, okay, thank you. And I guess just another quick question as well. Yes. Um, the sort of reticular activating system. Yes. Now, I appreciate this is a sort of very disparate group of neurons, um, but are there sort of areas where you can see sort of anatomical consolidations of it within the brainstem or? So uh, not really. So that, as you said, it's a very uh, uh, loosely arranged group of not just white matter tracts, but also small nuclei, uh, which are responsible for the reticulospinal tracts, but also the ascending spinoreticular tracts, and they communicate with the vestibular system and the rest of the uh, brainstem nuclei. They also talk with the uh, 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 centers of uh, respiration and the circulation. Uh, and they are, it's not a single area within the uh, brainstem that you can identify. It's a network which resides in the dorsal half of the brainstem, typically in the tegmental area, but it's very difficult to identify one specific area. And hence, uh, even a small infarct within the center can knock you out and cause brief episodes of unconsciousness because of sudden dissociation of this reticular activating system. Okay. But the uh, biggest congregation occurs at the top uh, of, of the bacillar as we talk about it, and hence any significant pathology at that level is going to give rise to a, a coma. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there anything else? I think the next week or two, there are sessions on, on some clinical conditions. Uh, I think Dr. Siripurupu will be uh, discussing some of the clinical conditions, if I'm not mistaken. And I think then after that, we again uh, restart, I think, uh, later in August on uh, the ventricular system, the meningeal systems, and the uh, cisterns within the brain substance. Uh, again, just anatomical concepts, but to try and highlight some of the pathology related to that. Okay, thank you so much. We'll sign off. Enjoy your Sunday.